We are live with Marius Alexa, a mental performance coach who lives in Dallas, Houston? Currently in Houston. Currently in Houston, yes. Um, and uh, myself, Coach Anna with uh, BAM, uh, Balance Art Multisport Triathlon uh, here in, well, I'm in Park City, but uh, we're based out in uh, Salt Lake. And we are gonna talk about part three um, of our coming back from COVID-19. Um, where do we go from here? So in part one and part two, in part one, we talked about reassessing our goals. Um, a lot of us have had races that have been canceled, um, including myself. My um, world championship in Amsterdam was just canceled last week. So um, I'm reassessing my goals for that. That was my A race. Um, and we talked about reassessing our goals in part one. And then in part two, we wanted to talk about where we are now. Like, what are we doing now? Um, not just in the sport of triathlon, um, but also um, in the mental sport of triathlon, I guess you could say. And then here on phase three and part three, we're going to talk about, you know, where do we go from here? Now that we've talked about part one and part two, we want to like, okay, we've got these, some of these tools and you've talked to us about, um, you know, how to reassess and, you know, how to do what we're doing now. And how do we move forward with that, Marius? Help us. Yeah. So, I would actually turn it back on you Great. and say <laughs> with that race being canceled, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so now that's in the past, right. right? You're here now. How can you see that impacting you moving forward? And when things do get to normal you're, and that's training, that's races, mm -hmm. you know, how do you feel like you're going to use that experience of training, preparing for that race, having it being canceled, having this time where you didn't know what's going to happen, you know, how do you see yourself using that moving forward? Well, I had a feeling that the race was going to be canceled. So I was okay. honestly, in my mind, I wasn't shocked. Um, I was prepared. It wasn't, you know, tragic, it, disappointing because um, I wanted yeah. to go compete on a world stage again. Um, and so this season, knowing that uh, not just that race, but previous smaller races have been canceled, I've just been working on, uh, as far as my triathlon world, I've been working on more of my bike strength um, and then more drills in the pool uh, now that we can, I can get back in the pool. So instead of trying to you know, cover the distance, my distance was gonna be an Ironman swim. Um, I'm now more concerned with fixing you know, my left crossover <laughs> in my yeah. swim stroke. And so, um, and also knowing that the race was gonna be canceled, I signed up last minute for a, a bike race slash ride called Lodaja and I got in. So um, I committed to that. And so now I'm going to ride 207 miles from Logan to Jackson in one day. Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, because <laughs> why not? <laughs> so, so that's what I just reassessing my goal, not reassessing my goals, my goals are the same. My goals are the same, it's to do well, to be the best athlete I can be. But now I have an opportunity now because I don't have a you know, big race schedule to kind of dial in more of skill training, strength workouts, I'm spending more time. I have been spending more time, even though I am a personal trainer, I've been spending more of the time in the gym on my own, working the workouts that I give all my clients. I've been definitely doing more of that, more foam rolling, so. And how do you think that that's, what is that going to look like? Let's say we fast forward, who knows how long, but we get to a point where everything's normal, mm -hmm. right? Which, what habits of those or what lessons from those are you going to keep and what's going to maybe change a little bit now that training is completely normal? One thing is uh, I definitely have more patience um, okay. because you, I had to, you, you, you know, I had to be patient. We were, our hands were tied as coaches. We, you know, everything, gyms were closed, pools were closed. You couldn't ride outside. You couldn't run outside barely. The weather was bad. It was just the end, especially here, it was the end of winter and the beginning of spring where the weather was just really um, crazy. Um, I couldn't see my people. Um, so you just had to kind of sit back and be patient um, and, you know, do what you could with the resources you had. Um, you know, and honestly, I've been talking to a lot of people in gratitude, you know, grateful for the, the assets and the skills and the, and the community that I have, um, that I've surrounded myself with my, my 
you know, BAM has been just unbelievable with their, you know, Zoom classes with the, uh, the online uh, cycling. And um, Ironman has really stepped up and now with their VR races and now they're, they're offering a championship series where you get a slot to a 70.3 world championship, which is huge. That's amazing. Yes, it really is. So I think the triathlon community, I mean, has really worked hard to support each other and, you know, as a whole. Um, and I just, I really, it kind of, you get to see that and we wouldn't have seen that if we didn't go through this. Yeah. So a couple of, so obviously you're saying the, the patience and the yeah. gratitude. Um, but I also sense like, you know, having to take a step back, you were intentional about what you wanted to attack or at least address during that time. And I don't know if those are necessarily weaknesses or uh, mm -hmm. things you just felt like you needed to address, but spending a little bit more time in the weight room, uh, addressing some of the technique in the pool. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you took an opportunity that you might've not had otherwise of oh, yeah. doing this bike yeah. ride, which I'm sure you're going to learn something about yourself as a competitor. Yeah, that's um, crazy. <laughs> and it sounds like it's outside of your normal, normal realm. And I'm, right? I'm a 50 year old woman, Marius. I just turned 50. That's amazing. I'm out of my mind. <laughs> that's, and, and that's amazing. And so, you know, you asked me a, about like how do we move forward and the reason why I wanted to ask you those questions is right. because that's what I would that's what the process looks like that's what I would recommend to athletes of you know it's it's how we started this series and it's how, what we talked about um last week it's it's a lot of reflection and then it's taking that the things that you learn from that reflection and becoming more intentional about them moving forward right? right and that ties into a lot of what we talked about the past two weeks about what you can control and what you can't control mm -hmm. right um in the controllables can you can exactly. you just touch on that again just in case someone might have missed it so what is controlling yeah. The controllables yeah so um controlling the controllables is just making sure that you're spending your energy and you're prioritizing your energy towards and focus towards the things that you can control. Mm -hmm. And as best as if you, you can letting go or accepting the rest that you can't control. Um, because we know from research that when you're focused and you're trying to control things that you can't control, right. it's going to negatively impact your performance, right? right? Um, you're just spending unnecessary energy um, unnecessary efforts in something that may or may not work out. Whereas you know that if you focus on the things that you truly control, so things like your effort, your self-talk, uh, your routines, uh, maybe your training schedules, things that are truly inside your control, uh, then it's up to you, right? Yeah. And that can lead not just to better performance, but more fulfillment in what you're doing, right? Because then if you gave your best effort in those things that you can control and you didn't get the result you wanted, you at least knew that you did what you could control, right? right? And so it's a way to then cope with these things in sport, which is a lot of things outside of our control, right? We don't, we don't control our competitors. We don't control the weather, the environment. The environment. Mm -hmm. We don't control coaches, friends, family. Um, you know, a tire popping, you know, a suit malfunction, goggles coming off, those things are outside of your control, right? And I think as athletes, we can all think of times when we let something like that get to us um, and it complete, completely derailed our performance, right? right. Um, and so that's why we try to focus on what we can control. And that's why I liked your, your example, the two things you took away from this time uh, being more patient mm -hmm. and, and kind of feeling and expressing that gratitude. Those are two things that are very much in your control, yes. right? Um, and that's, those are things that you can work on uh, and be intentional about. And so for these athletes, after you reflect on this time, um, I remember the first series that we did Mm -hmm. And looking back in the past, one of the things that I recommended is 
almost cast yourself in the future, right? And say, when this time ends, like, what would I have liked to get out of it, right? What would I have liked to learn? We had visualization. We had taught, right, to visualize what it's going to look like. And yeah. now that's what we're really focusing on is visualizing our future. Yeah. And, and so now is your time to act on that stuff, right? right? To be intentional about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, we want to make sure that moving forward, we somehow find ways to bring this stuff in right. so that we don't lose sight of it moving forward, right? So that two months down the road, I might have a conversation with you. And I'm and not like, patient oh, anymore. Shoot. <laughs> I completely forgot to be patient, right? I'm, I'm back to where I was. Or, yeah. um, you know, I forgot that, that really nice sense of gratitude that I felt mm -hmm. during this time. And so what I really would encourage athletes to do is put systems in place, figure out a way, have the conversations, whether it's with your coaches, teammates, uh, but also have that conversation with yourself of how do I make sure this is sustainable? Right. Um, for me, a lot of it, and we mentioned it before, but a lot of it comes with journaling and note taking, right. um, yeah. to make sure that you're as intentional as possible, but then there's other tools that you can use. So self-talk is going to be huge, right? What are you saying to yourself? So give us an example a daily of basis. with your athletes, like what is some self-talk that you have not, everyone obviously has their own talk, like, you know. Yeah. But what are, what are some examples that either you have recommended or some of your athletes have used in the past? Yeah. Um, so everyone's different, right? And right. Um, I try to actually get the conversation away from negative and positive self-talk and more okay. focus on productive and unproductive self-talk. Okay. Um, so they're closely related, but sometimes for some people, negative self-talk can work. Um, but it's just, it's, so it's more of a matter of, is it leading to productive measures or productive action, right? So and so- Example of negative self-talk, like, what do you mean? Like, how, like- give me So, a yeah, so if someone's almost kind of beating up on themselves and okay. saying, hey, that wasn't good enough, right? Okay. A lot of people will take that too far right? And it will shoot down their confidence, um, might make them withdraw. Uh, it might lead to a lot of negative, unproductive emotions. But for some people in that moment, saying, hey, that wasn't good enough, you need to do better, is yeah. kind of the straight talk that they need to have with themselves. And mm -hmm. if that leads them to adjust their training methods, or maybe uh, shift out of an unproductive mindset, then that worked, right? But if that negativity continues to spiral and it's unchecked and it's not even accurate, right? If, if you're saying you are the worst racer ever, it's like, well, no, you're no. not, no. right? But there are also, you know, you'll hear extreme examples of um, some athletes fuel themselves off of that. Uh, now, I would argue that over the long term, that might be unsustainable. Yeah. Um, but so, and, and so that's why I kind of make the distinction of productive and unproductive. So, uh, uh, productive would be intentionally talking to yourself. So, not mm -hmm. just listening to your thoughts, right. um, talking to yourself as if you're talking to a teammate. So, literally saying, you got this, or, you know, you're in the middle of a real tough training block and it's unpleasant, but you will get through this or it will be over in five minutes and you're going to be satisfied with it or fulfilled with it. Uh, so intentional talking to yourself instead of listening to yourself. Um, and then for some people having mantras or having specific things that they say to themselves mm -hmm. or repeat themselves um, works for some people, they find it um, kind of too tacky or just unrealistic and so it's just it's a matter of finding kind of finding what works for you uh mm -hmm. but there's no excuse to say um you know negative self-talk works for me just because that's what comes naturally it's that examination of like 
is this leading to productive results, right? And so if you just keep beating yourself up and you're not having the race results that you would like, or you feel like you could do better, it's I'm time sure. to say, you know, it's not working, right? Yeah. And I need to explore something differently. And the self-talk is really, really difficult because most of us have a running narrative all the time. Yes. Uh, and that's why you've seen techniques like mindfulness become more popular mm -hmm. because it's trying to find a way to not even quiet those thoughts, but kind of distance yourself from the thoughts and realize you are not your thoughts um, to give yourself just a little bit of a space. But um, the tough part with the fact that we always kind of have this running narrative is that if it's left unchecked, it's probably going to go to a more negative state. Right. And so it does take a lot of effort and it does take a lot of work to get to the point where um, it comes a little bit easier. But I suspect from most people's backgrounds that it's going to be a continuous process and it's just catching yourself as quickly as you can and kind of getting yourself to a more productive space. Um, so, you know, in the middle of a race, that might look like you're in the middle of the run, you're struggling a little bit. Mm -hmm. mind starts to go down a negative path right. and we've all been there. what we've all been there <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then having the awareness of catching yourself of saying oh I'm going down a negative path mm -hmm. and once you have that awareness it it does help distance a little bit and that's your opportunity to say hey you know start talking to yourself saying this is, this is really, really tough. Acknowledge it, be accurate about it, but you can finish it, right? You will be able to do this or even bring in stuff from your training or from your past of like, Hey, you've done this many times. It's never been fun. It's never been pleasant, but you will finish. Yeah, you will do it. Right. Before. Yeah. And so the more you do that, the quicker that awareness is going to come along. Um, but again, that's why we talk about intention too, right? So Mm -hmm. maybe intention right before the uh, the run right before the bike right before the swim and right before the race as overall mm -hmm. so that you say hey i'm really going to try on this run to stay in a productive mind space right mm -hmm. or uh on the bike it's like hey i know at mile x my thoughts usually turn i'm gonna purposely at that time try to really focus in on what i'm thinking about and put it in a more productive way. So that's where you mentioned visualization. Mm -hmm. That's another tool that can be used to help athletes with that, where you visualize out the race. Right. Um, and for some athletes, it can be helpful to kind of find the tricky points that have happened in the past and visualize how you would like them to ideally go. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you know, for some people it works to visualize it not going quite the way that they want and how do they recover? Yeah. How do they respond? Right. Because I would imagine if I would ask most athletes or even triathletes of like, Hey, tell me some common stuff that happens to you on the run that might push you towards an unproductive space, you know, plenty of, they could give you plenty of examples, right? Right you could have athletes visualize around those times of like, okay, take that example. And if it didn't end the way that you wanted, what are some things that you could have done differently? Right. Right. Um, and so I think depending on the athlete that you are doing both of those, the ideal race, but also the one that incorporates common pitfalls, common mistakes, can be helpful because for some athletes, if they only visualize the ideal yeah. and, and something so happens, bad happens, it's, it's panic. Happen. Yep. Right. Um, a lot of times so, I find as a coach in the, it's in the training that we get an opportunity to utilize, you know, a bad training session, um, so that negative where we can say, okay, so what did we do? You know, what could we have done to overcome this negative mindset? 
you know, when you hit that third interval and you just couldn't make it, you know, was it really a physical challenge or was it something in your mind? And then, yeah. okay, so well, maybe it was just in my mind. Okay, so then let's next time, let's figure out how we can push through that. And so we use the training, not just physically, not just your cardio, not just your muscular, not just your hydration and your fueling, but also your mental state, your mental strategy in some, you know, those high intensity blocks or those long, you know, brick days or, you know, some of those group swims that we do where we put our athletes in that scenario, a possible negative scenario for, for real under a safe environment and let them experience and work through that negative space. And then we talk about it. We, you know, as coaches we've had, we, uh, last year we had a big, uh, I think it was 50 of people showed up to this big open water event that we had and we separated them in groups and we talked about, you know, how they handled the situation and then what they would have done differently or, and, and they're all, because they were all together on the group and all talking with amongst each other, you know, they got ideas from me and knowing that they weren't the only ones with that negative yeah. headspace sometimes. Yeah. And the water is one of the biggest ones because obviously, you know, the bike, you could unclip and, you know, kind of take a break. The run, you could just walk or stop. The swim, you can't, well, you can't you have stop. To keep going. Right? You'll get swum over. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I do. I think there's a lot of power in the sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think oftentimes, athletes will make things worse by believing that's a problem unique to them right and they're I, like right oh like why do i get so negative at this point of the swim or you know why do i get so negative after i get kicked in the face and then i have a bad <laughs> it's it like, <laughs> yeah and it's it's just like it's there's i i think there's something that releases you when you know that everyone deals with this mm -hmm. or people have dealt with it. Right. And so that's one thing. But the other thing is often talking to other athletes will give you a lot of good ideas, right? Mm -hmm. They might casually mention like, Oh, this is what I do. And you realize like, Oh, I've never tried that. And then all of a sudden that gives you another tool for your toolkit to try mm -hmm. out. And what I liked you talking about the training is that's a perfect time to test run things for yourself right. mentally, right? right? My job as a mental performance coach is to know the research uh, and to have tools to suggest, but it's on the athlete to do the work, apply it and figure out what works for them, mm -hmm. right? Just because I know that this is what the research says, we all know that, you know, you know, if you have a background in research, you know that that doesn't mean it works for 100% of the people, right? right? And so, you know, if, if you get a suggestion from a mental performance coach, from any coach, from an, another athlete, and you find that it doesn't work for you at all, that's totally fine, right? Mm -hmm. You just keep looking for things that do work and are effective. Now, once you do that, that's why it's so important to review and learn from that, right? So you describe that conversation that you might have with an athlete after you maybe programmed for a tougher spot to see how they would react. Right. My biggest fear is that athlete just walking away from that session and not reflecting on it, not learning something from it, right? Just saying that was a terrible session. Right. And to me, that's a missed opportunity, right? Because even though you had a terrible session, you could have gotten better by learning from it and taking something away from it and putting an actionable plan towards the next time, right? right? And so then when you have that next swim session or do you have that next tough situation that your coach is going to put you in, you again set that in intention, mm -hmm. you go through it to the best of your ability and then you do another review saying, how did that work? Was that better? Was that worse? And it's just training, right? It's time to try out different things so that by the time you get to race day, um, you know what you're comfortable with or you know what's effective for you or you know what has been productive. And so right. then you race, you test it out and see if it's still productive, right? And it's the loop just continues. And that's kind of what we talk about in terms of like process orientation and- yeah. It's, we, 
when you and I finished talking last time, actually, we were, um, when we signed off with Facebook, we were on together for like at least almost another 20 minutes, just chatting. Yep. I could talk to you for a long time, just like yeah. that brain of yours. Um, and you, we talked about this phrase you called name it to tame it. Yeah. Um, and I kind of like that, not just because it rhymes and it rolls off the tongue, but can you explain what you mean by that name it to tame it? Yeah. So that falls under kind of the self-talk and mm -hmm. both self-talk and sort of the mindfulness where um, when you're able to label an emotion or a thought that pops up. Mm -hmm. um, by just labeling it, naming it, right. you kind of take away some of its power that it might have over you, right? So um, let's say you're racing on a bike and you get cut off, right? And it's all of a sudden messes up timing, pace, whatever it might be. And you, you feel this anger start boiling up right and it might make you do make some questionable decisions that m are not in the best interest of your performance overall right? right maybe it makes you try to chase that person down Which would be and very you just completely gas yourself whatever it might be but by kind of working on this skill of just naming it of okay that's anger right, right? what just boiled up that's anger it builds in a little bit of response time there where right. you can make a choice about, well, what do you want to do? Right. So the anger's there. How am I going to react? How am I going to respond? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, when you're in the middle of that tough swim set that we keep referencing and, you know, you might not be doing as well as you'd like to right. just naming it as frustration. Right? right. Or even it's like, that's fear of failure. Right. I, you know, that's that, that feeling of failing that's coming up. That's what it is. And so it won't make those emotions or thoughts go away, but mm -hmm. they won't overtake you, right? It won't overtake your mind. Mm -hmm. You're, you're distancing yourself a little bit and you're giving yourself that space to make a choice that is in line with your goals, in line with your performance, as opposed to just being at the whim of the conditions that you're in. Right, right. So like controlling the controllables. You can control exactly. your attitude, um, but you can't control what that person did, you know, or... Yeah. And then sometimes I think it like talking about the swim set, because that's an immediate um, uh, feedback for me anyway. You know, you're doing 100 in the pool on a specific time set with a specific recovery. And you have to do, you know, X amount of them and you're, you know, you hit the first three, you hit the next four, you're getting too close on the fifth one. And on the sixth one, you barely make it. And the seventh one, you're behind. And then the eighth one, it's just a downhill from there. So you've just got to accept the fact that this is what the coach wrote, right? They, they felt you were capable. If you just didn't have it that day, then you just, you keep plugging along and you can kind of name it as, like you said, maybe a little fatigue is set in or something and not get emotional about it not take it personally almost you know yeah i have time well times an so i would say, you know why did you have me do this set when you know you know i can't do x you know um this on the interval and i'm like well you know looking at your previous workouts in the past 10 days i can see that you can do this so you you know let's try again and let's maybe take maybe an extra break or split the set up a little bit you know, to make it more, you know, bite it off in smaller chunks. But, you know, it's just, it's believing, I think, in yourself and not playing that negative talk. So there's two things. So in that hypothetical athlete, in that scenario, um, you know, we could work on self-talk. But there's two other areas that I would explore as well. And okay. one of the, one of that, the areas is staying present, right? right taking that moment for what it is, right? So you failed that seventh rep or whatever it was, the 700, 300, and just being present in that moment. Mm -hmm. So not extrapolating, not making a bigger story of like, well, because I missed this interval, it means that I'm not prepared for the race that I have coming up, or it means I'm never going to be a good triathlete, or it means I, it's like, no, you've missed that one rep, right? And so 
maybe staying present is something that they need to work on. Um, but then I also just forgot the second area that I was going to explore with them. Um, yeah, but if I remember, but the point is like, there's many different areas that you can explore for each athlete. Right. And it's, it's going to depend on that athlete. Um, and so, you know, that's obviously why I recommend working with a mental performance coach to work on these things. But if they're not, then making sure that they have a process or a system in place so that they're constantly vetting themselves on these things and, you know, having some space to sit down and reflect on why did I extrapolate? Why, why did that make me think that, you know, my race isn't going to go as well as I wanted to. So. Yeah. Um, Another thing we talked about was, um, which I really like, because uh, this kind of goes back to a book I just recently read by Michael Dauphiny. Um, And one of the, or two of the chapters was based on ownership and permission. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Because we had talked about that last week um, at the end of our talk. Yeah. Um, to me, ownership is very closely related to controlling what you can, right? Um, and taking ownership of that, right? So, and it, it actually ties into a lot of things, right? If I think of an athlete who takes ownership of their process, um, they're going to own the mistakes that they've made mm-hmm. and they're going to try to learn and get better. They're going to own the things that they did really well, right? right? And they're going to, they're going to build upon that. They're going to build their confidence on top of the things that they do well. Right. But at the same time, if you're taking ownership of everything, you're going to build confidence on the things that you didn't do well, because you take full accountability for it. And you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to keep going down this process of controlling what I can and doing everything that is in my power to make sure I get better at that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the ownership for me is tied very closely to controlling what they can, where their focus is, uh, whether they're internally or externally motivated. The permission, I think, is tied very closely to mindset. And that's actually what I was going to mention with the swimmer in our hypothetical scenario is- you just me. <laughs> but exploring their mindset, right? Are they in a fixed mindset or are they in a growth mindset? Do they believe that they can continue get to get better? Do they believe that just because they failed, they're going to keep failing, right? Mm-hmm. So where's their mindset around that? And I think when I think about permission, it's, it's putting yourself in that growth mindset and you're permitting yourself to fail right? Mm-hmm. To put it all on the line and right. have it not work out the way that you want sometimes. But it's also permitting yourself to be as best as you can, right? There are people that will hold themselves back because mm-hmm. there's a comfort to knowing that, well, I can at least succeed this much, right? right. So, uh, you know, if I take out this swim this way, I know I'm probably not going to set a PR, but I'll do okay. Right. And I can walk away and it's giving yourself that permission of like, go for it. Right. Right. See how far you can push yourself, give yourself permission to be as great as you can be. Um, and so that to me ties very closely to mindset. It's a way of putting yourself in that growth mindset of, um, giving that permission to yourself and ties very closely to ownership because to me, those are permissions that you give to yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And so instead of worrying about what people will think, instead of worrying about getting permission from my coaches, my teammates, it's having these honest conversations with yourself of, what you might feel like is holding you back or what is it that you need in order to feel great about your race, right? I mean, I've um, been in a situation 
um, where the permission went the wrong way, um, I think. And I see this a lot. Um, I was at a race and um, I was getting my, uh, uh, you go up and get your registration packet at the race day. So there were people in line and um, here locally, a lot of athletes all know each other and we get to see each other at the races. That's one of the things we love about racing. Um, and so I was in line and I saw someone else talking to someone else in line and she had come up like she had, she said, oh, hi, how are you? And the first thing out of this lady's mouth was, she didn't get a good night's sleep and her ankle hurts and blah, blah, blah. and she's giving herself in my mind permission to not do well that day by just verbalizing that it's not yeah. a good day for all these other reasons. And they might be totally valid and, and in real life and to her. Um, but I just, that really struck me as like, you know, just her giving herself permission to, to not do well, to not give her best, you know, to yeah. not take ownership. And I, it's like, as I hear you talk and all the, the com in the conversations that we've had, everything is intertwined. It's like a Rubik's cube. It, like it all, it's all this, nothing is without the other thing. So you can't have yeah. that permission. You can't have visualization without self, some sort of self-talk. And, you know, this is all, you've got to have a little piece of the puzzle of the, in order to put the whole puzzle together, I guess. Maybe it's more like a puzzle, but yeah, with the yeah. permission thing, that's so that, would one way I saw it negatively I yeah and I do see that often and, and so I I do want to clarify when I say permission to fail <laughs> it's to do your you best know, it, to fail. yeah it, it, it's to say that it's to say that you will give the best effort mm -hmm. and you will do the to the best of your current abilities right and it might not work out the way that you want mm -hmm. right it might not get you the outcome that you want at that time um, you know, something outside of your control might happen that you don't yeah. foresee happening and just go, you know, everything goes off the rails. But to me, that failure is very different because you can walk away knowing that you gave your best effort, right? Mm -hmm. Or that you were, you were at a hundred percent of what you had to give. Whereas in the instance that you described, it's like, that person is kind of setting these conditions up so that they have this safety net to walk away saying, right. oh, you know, I, I, I knew that it wasn't going to go well because I didn't have these tap, these things happen. And that's kind of when we talk about permission kind of coming from yourself, coming mm -hmm. internally, I think that's why it's so important. Because if I had to guess, um, a lot of that is for the other people, but it also happens to ourselves. Right. And that's why you want to give the permission to yourself. But when that's verbalized, it's setting up so that if people see you, you know, maybe get 10th when you probably should have been top five, they said, oh yeah, well, you know, she, she did say that she didn't have, have good sleep. Right. And so they're hoping to kind of get off the hook. But what's interesting to me is that, you know, we don't have to live her life and we don't have to live her career or her sport. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that, you know, she might not walk away. You know, she might place better than someone else right. and walk away less fulfilled because she just set these conditions, right? Whereas someone might've crashed their bike because they were doing everything they could to the best of their ability. And they were with the front of the pack and, just something happened, they might actually be able to walk away feeling more fulfilled and better about their race. Um, because they put, or, it, they put it all out you know, there. Yeah. And, and you talk about patience. It's like, you know, they might not feel great at that day, right. but I trust that if we check in with both of those people at the end of their, you know, triathlon careers, Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that that one that gave themselves that permission to be great that day and, you know, didn't seek out the excuses instead sought out the things that were going to help them succeed. They're going to kind of more satisfied and more fulfilled and probably objectively further along in their careers. You know, um, a great way to catalyst into the, to the last thing that I, I so want to discuss is the, focusing on being more process oriented and not outcome oriented. Yeah. 
And we talked um, in length before we got on today with regards to this. So, so I mean, because we all know about the process and we all know that there is an outcome, whatever it is, but let's talk about what you had mentioned, like how you talk an athlete through that. Yeah. So unsurprisingly, it comes back to controlling the controllables. No. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shocking. But <laughs> it's because, and you know, the process has become very popular, right? And it's like capital T, capital P, the process, the process. And everyone keeps talking about the process. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's become so important is because that is in your control how you go about the process and the process is unique to teams. It's unique to individuals, um, but it's what they're doing to prepare to have the best outcome possible. Right. Right. Um, but it's also the recognition that you do not control the outcome. Right. And so one thing that you and I discussed is um, you might've had a terrible process and because of things outside of your control, you, you had a podium finish. Well, right. yeah, because like we said, if you showed up to a race with 10 other athletes and they were kind of a subpar field and you just got lucky, um, yep. place first, then that was an outcome. But the process, like you said, like we talked before, wasn't, it wasn't like you gave it your all. You didn't take ownership yeah. or give yourself. Might've been sloppy. There might've been mistakes. You know, right. you might've been one. unfocused and the danger there is then you walk away from that race, not necessarily motivated or inspired to kind of look back and, and learn from it and then, or to grow from it. And then all of a sudden you show up to the next race and you're thinking that you can just do the same thing. And all of a sudden you don't get the same result and you're disappointed. Whereas on the flip side, you have an athlete who gave it their all, did everything to the best of their ability and swam as, or swam, ran, biked to the closest, uh, as perfect as possible. And maybe it just so happens that, you know, the best athletes came and showed out that day and they placed outside of top 10, mm -hmm. right? If you don't have the process and the outcome separated, you might be incredibly disappointed. And we talked about as athletes, there's always going to be emotions involved, right? Because we're competitors. We want to win. We want to do the best we can. No one should like losing. But it's looking at the bigger picture and making sure that, well, if that was the best that you can do, you want to make sure you're able to repeat that and keep doing that because that's going to give you the best chance of having the best career that you can. Mm -hmm. Or you, you need to trust that that will get give you the best chance again like I said before it's going to give you the best chance for the outcomes that you want right mm -hmm. um and it's it's the need to separate those two and saying you control this the process mm -hmm. and you have zero control over this the outcome yeah who shows right and so control? yeah and I so the more that you can focus on that that process yeah it's more likely that you're going to get outcomes that you want but again, it's never guaranteed. And so the way that I usually go about it with an athlete is um, I usually want them to define what their process is, right? Because these days it's so easy to just say, oh, you know, the process, I'm working the process or trust the process, <laughs> especially trust the process. And it's like, well, you need to know what your process is. Right. And, and I'm not talking about just mentally, it's it's physically and, and doing the things that you can and, you know, kind of looks similar to identifying what you can control and what you can't control, but knowing what you're going to trust. So what is the process? What does it look like? What does it look like for you? So that when that outcome ha happens, whether it's what you would have liked or not liked, you know what you're going to fall back on mm -hmm. and you know what you're going to keep keep doing moving forward right and so I want my athletes to be as explicit and specific as possible about what the process is um, mentally and physically to know that you know that's what they're going to keep doing win or lose or you know favorable or unfavorable outcome 
Um, and granted, process changes all the time, um, and that's okay. Right. But um, if you don't make it specific, I think there's a certain hollowness to saying trust the process or just work the process. And it's like, well, what does that mean? You don't know what that is. What right. does it mean to you, right? So trust, yeah. So you need to you need to define it for yourself. You need to know what is it that you're working. What is it that you're trusting? Um, and there's always a temptation, right? Of when you do get a favorable outcome or you get an outcome that you want, there's always that temptation to kind of get further from the process or kind of loosen up um, the reins on that and the focus on that and say, oh, it's working. Um, when I think that's dangerous to consistent and sustained high performance, right? Mm -hmm. I think the best of the best realize that, you know, kind of the, the better they become, the harder they have to keep working, yes. right? And the process keeps in evolving. And if you, if you reach a new level of success, it's going to take a whole extra step of that process yeah. to get you to the next outcome that you want. Um, and and the, the other thing I think is that it, it, when you focus on that process and you're working on that process, it helps you sustain that drive, right? Mm -hmm. Like you might have an outcome that you're chasing, like qualifying for worlds, right? But once you qualify for worlds, there's going to be something next, right? <laughs> and so if you're so focused just on that one outcome, mm -hmm. it can lead to these feelings of like, okay, well, you know, I did this and, and now what, but if you can rest on your process of like, well, I'm always going to continue working hard. I'm always going to continue, you know, this process, what it looks like for me, um, until I'm done with triathlon, then I think it also helps kind of with the greater fulfillment in the sport. Right. And, and the process is also learning how to set a process, learning how to define it, learning how to trust it, learning how to work it also lends itself to a lot of different things just outside of the sport. Mm -hmm. And so I think when, you know, I can't say for certain, but I'd say that people that are very process oriented probably transition very well post-sport, you know, post-races, things like that. It's, they're not necessarily left with a big empty void that a lot of us are familiar with. Right. Well, like how I think a lot of athletes might feel now because yeah. any, not any, but a lot of our possible outcomes, which was even standing, you know, with our feet in the water to start the race have been, you know, either canceled or postponed. Um, so this, you know, finishing with the process oriented instead of outcome oriented, finishing with that idea is where all of us are right now. And I think the process, like how I said, it's patience and gratitude and focusing on, on my inside and then on the outside of my, you know, gym, cycling strength and swim skills. But I think if we kind of take that process um, of triathlon and cycle inward and, and focus more on, you know, like we talked about revisiting our why, you know, because the, if the why is just a podium or just a finish, then then we've all lost that why this year. So is that really your why? Is that really why yeah. you are involved in the sport of triathlon? Probably not. Of all of my clients right now I have, and the ones I've worked with in the past, I can honestly say no one could say their why was just a podium or just to qualify, especially as you get into the training season after season, you see how it changes you, how it reflects other aspects of your life and your personality and you know, the people you get to meet and the community that surrounds you, it's your why is definitely not a podium finish or even, you know, an iron, just to finish an Ironman. It's the process of the, of getting to that finish line. Yeah. Not and I think when people look at that, it's, you know, you can even ask more questions there of like, why, why is finishing an Ironman so important to you? Yeah. Right. And they, they might say it, you know, to me, it's the epitome of health, right? It means I'm, I'm healthy or, you know, I'm as strong as I can be. And 
even questions like that might help you realize that, you know, maybe if the, maybe if you never do finish an Ironman, maybe you are as healthy as you will be, right? Maybe you are the strongest you ever have been. And that's not to say that it will erase the pain of not finishing an Ironman, but it, it makes, it gives you that perspective on where you are on your goals, right? I think of an example of like how many people join a sport to just be healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Or to, to have a community um, and to have fun, right? And then all of a sudden they do a race and they're like, well, okay, now I need to qualify for this, right? And so then they qualify for that and have that race. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well now I need to qualify for this or I need to win this race. And all of a sudden you're down that road and they're getting really good at the sport, but mm -hmm. there's almost this unfulfilling aspect to it. Right. Because they've gotten away from why they're doing it. And now again, why your why can change, your purpose can change. Yeah. yeah. But I also look at that example and say, if someone's really passionate about doing this because of the community, coming back to that might actually free you up mm -hmm. to go much further in the sport than you anticipated or get you past the sticking point because you realize, you know what, I'm actually really close to accomplishing, you know, doing what I want to do. And that's to be part of a community or that's to have fun training every single day. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think there's definitely some, once you get separated from that purpose, there can be some fear returning to it because you're like, well, what if I don't do well anymore? And what are people going to think? But I yeah. actually think it frees people up. I think it actually can, when people gain clarity on that, um, it actually allows them to perform even better. I agree. I think also another good way of doing that would be to, and I can say this, volunteer. Volunteer at a race, a local race um, or an Ironman or half Ironman or some other branded. They're always looking for help. And I can tell you right now, if you're handing out water cups at mile 21 on the marathon at an Ironman and you're seeing that pain that you've experienced before, that brings it back to your why. And for you to give that enthusiasm and that, you know, come on, you've got it kind of attitude to, and, and you know, multiple athletes passing you by, then that just, it just, for me, I love volunteering. It just reignites my flame of why I do the, the sport of triathlon or multi-sport because of the community of, of what we give to each other, you know, and I love the health aspect, you know, I love the accountability for me. It's accountability is a big why for me, um, but to be able to to make an impact on somebody else's life. That's my, that's my why. That's another reason why I coach. So, yeah. yeah. And that's outside of, outside of those very good higher order and virtuous things that come out of that, right. I find that interesting because it can actually help you with more of the nitty gritty mental skills because um, I find, you know, I've actually recommended to athletes, uh, whether they're in high school and college is, Mm -hmm. similar of like go find a way to coach your sport because all of a sudden you you see things differently right and so when you're able to look at that runner at mile 100 you know wherever they might be on their bike and you see the struggle and you see what they're going through it can give you a different perspective of what you want to be doing at that moment, what you want to be saying to yourself, right? Because if you, at that moment, you're just like, you're cheering them on, you, you want them to finish. And then realizing maybe if you switch places, maybe you're in a very deep, negative, dark place. It's like, oh yeah, I would, I would prefer this, or this is what I could do. And so that in itself right. can give you a lot of hints or suggestions of things to try out or try differently if you're volunteering don't say you're almost there don't say <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't clap and say you're almost there because you never you can be a mile away and it doesn't feel like you're almost there <laughs> well you know that's that's the other way right it's putting yourself in that athlete shoe yeah. and, and saying you know what you know i've had conversations with athletes where i've encouraged them to have conversations with coaches and family members because the things that they're saying are not helpful Right. or they're stressing them out or, and granted, 
they mean well. that's they mean well and mm -hmm. it's out of their control but what is in your control is having a conversation with them and educating them of like hey you know what i find you know i love that you come to my races i love that you cheer on when you say almost there yeah. i have a tough time with that like here are a couple different things that maybe you'd say right and then that's really you know next time if they go and they say almost there again, it's like, all right, well, <laughs> that's where you work on your own response, but at least you did your part of educating them, right? right. And giving them suggestions of what might work better. Um, because I guarantee you that that person that's yelling almost there is not trying to cause you pain. No. They're not trying to cause you harm. They're, they're yeah. well-intentioned. They're just maybe not as educated, not as informed as they could be about how to help. Yeah, but when you're, yeah, it's funny though. Um, I did want to highlight though, um, as triathletes, we have multiple resources um, like Marius. Um, you can contact him anytime through Facebook or Instagram. Um, through this um, Facebook Live, you can message him or leave a comment and I can get you in touch with him. Yep. But also um, Team USA, uh, because May was Mental Health Month, um, Team USA took an opportunity to send out an email um, with a number of different um, topics with regard to the COVID-19 um, crisis, but also um, athletes that have struggled with OCD um, or death of a loved one or dealing with uncertainty. So I do highly recommend if you're interested in checking that out, I'll put the link um, in, the, in the comments. And then lastly, um, triathlon, uh, USA Triathlon is working in conjunction with Talkspace. And Talkspace is a online uh, community of uh, therapists who have been vetted um, through Talkspace that you can then go online and they will match you with someone, probably similar to Marius, but they wouldn't, you know, anyway, and you get a discount or something or get to know about their promotions. So that's, again, something you might want to check out. It's, it's Talkspace.com. Um, and as a USA uh, Triathlon member, if you are, um, great. If you're not, you should be. Um, you can connect with um, uh, health and wellness support through Talkspace. Um, and then we have Marius. Marius, you need to write a book. It doesn't have I've, to be I've, I've you been know. told um, <laughs> maybe someday that would be, mm -hmm. that'd be fun, um, but. Fun, but I think it would be, you are, you are a wealth of knowledge and the way that you communicate what you have in your mind, like, I can understand, I can, I feel like it's talking to me. I feel like it's talking to people I know. It's very relatable. I appreciate that. Cause there are often times where you, that, you walk away, you're wondering like, did that come across the way that, you know, you were thinking about it, but that that's, that's what this is, right? It's, you know, it doesn't, we all have surface level knowledge of these right. things and right. it's, making sure that people can relate to it, people can understand it, uh, people can know why it's important. And so to me, that's the most important part, right? It's, you know, I can, I can dump a bunch of knowledge on you and if you walk away just being like, well, that was overwhelming, it's not gonna help you as an athlete. Um, I talked about, you said you have the research that backs the ideas that you know are, will work. But if you yeah. can't communicate that to your athlete, and then that athlete can't take that and run with it, then your knowledge and all that research to that particular individual is useless. Yeah. 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 And so it's, you know, from, from our end as mental performance coaches, it's, it's just finding different ways to say a lot of the same things. And I don't say that with any negative connotation. It's um, just knowing that to each person, it's, um, different things are going to be important and they're going to relate, relate to different things. And so, um, you know, it's finding different ways to take ownership, different ways to give permission to yourself, different ways to control the controllables. And you just have to keep trying, keep trying, keep, keep trying. But I do appreciate that a lot because, um, that's my process, right? Okay. That is, uh, it's, it's, it's working on that part. And I, <laughs> Do not control the outcome. I don't control if people enjoy it or not, but I hope that they do. Well, I'm giving you permission to write a book. <laughs> Thank you. I needed that. I wasn't giving it to myself. <laughs> well, Maurice, it's been awesome to talk with you. Um, I hope that we do something in the future again. And if you have any comments or questions for Maurice, again, like I said, you can message him um, directly on Instagram or on Facebook under Maurice Alexis. 
And um, I am Anna Nemeke, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much again, Marius, for talking Thank with you. us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Oops, I think we're off.